Hello, my name is Min Jung Kim, and I'm the director and CEO of the New Britain Museum of American Art. Thank you for joining us tonight for this evening's Robert Lehman Distinguished Lecture. I'm especially pleased to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Daniel J. Broiled, who is an assistant professor of public history and African-American history at Central Connecticut State University. Dr. Broiled earned his PhD in 19th century United States and African diaspora history at Howard University in 2011. His work focuses on the American Canadian borderlands and issues of black identity, migration and transnational relations, as well as oral history and museum community interaction. Dr. Broiled is currently working on a manuscript with the University of Toronto Press. Tonight's lecture, Black Grassroots Graffiti and Memorial Transforming from Informal to Formal Museum Spaces, will examine the history of graffiti as it moved from the grassroots and streets to formal museum galleries, addressing the modern quest in several urban centers to have legal public spaces for free form art. The talk will weave in how the dynamic work of artist Chantelle Martin and the philosophy of draw on everything fits into this conversation perfectly. We are grateful to the Robert Lehman Foundation for supporting tonight's lecture, as well as their ongoing support of exhibitions, including the recent exhibition, Someday Is Now. Without further ado, I am honored to introduce Dr. Daniel Broyd. Thank you, Dr. Broyd, for joining us tonight. Thank you. So cheers, I am honored to be giving a lecture for the museum uh, tonight. It has um, certainly been cool to work with the organizers of this uh, lecture. Um, they have been very uh, welcoming and accommodating. Um, so with that being said, uh, the title of my talk tonight will be Black Grassroots Graffiti and Memorial Transforming from Informal to Formal Museum Spaces. So with that being said, uh, the presentation will examine the history of graffiti as it moved from the grassroots and streets to formal museum galleries, and it will address the modern quests in several urban centers uh, to have legal public spaces for free form art. The talk will weave in how the dynamic work of Chantel Martin's philosophy on right on everything fits into the conversation and all it will highlight how art, accessibility, um, introspection, improvisation, and intersectionality can produce new realities. With that being said, I would like to start uh, from a place um, of my childhood. How about that? Um, when you know, skateboarding was really kind of outlawed in a lot of municipalities. And I remember like a lot of my friends used to get, you know, fines and stuff like that for skateboarding. So cities um, and towns have evolved to craft skate parks and safe spaces for people to enjoy their hobby without the threat of being outcasted or arrested. In thousands of skate parks in the United States and around the world, skateboarding has skateboarders have found a community and are able to refine their skills uh, as a result of these inventive endeavors. Also, you have things like the X Games. Uh, since the summer um, of uh, 1995 in Newport, uh, Rhode Island, where skateboarding was kind of legitimized through um, these games, like the Olympic Games for skateboarding. Also ESPN would cover it and you would have these sponsors as well. And so I thought, you know, why aren't these spaces given to graffiti art artists? Can we, you know, craft the same kind of safe spaces and zone areas uh, to be crafted for graffiti artists? Graffiti has long been associated with urban decay, vandalism, and gangs. But can legal graffiti public spaces aid in transforming the perception um, of this art? I would like to, you guys to think about if you can, you know, go out and just, you know, um, this evening in spray paint somewhere in uh, New Britain that is legal, right? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? So I started to really think about that for graffiti spaces. Also, there has been many misconceptions um, of graffiti. 
um, you know, negative notions of this art medium, you know, shade is historical value. And it's a pill to the public uh, for, you know, grasping what has been drawn. Um, you know, some have really, you know, said like, you know, who are these kind of wayward renegades that are writing obscenities and drawing flagrant unseemly images and other puzzling one-upping layered uh, wording, you know, slanguage that they simply cannot uh, decipher. But, you know, there are many things that are not quite understood about um, graffiti. And I would like to just kind of orientate us to um, graffiti. So early artists, uh, such as Taki uh, 180, 183 of New York City and Cornbread of Philadelphia, they referred to their art as writing and to themselves as writers. Uh, many artists consider, you know, the notion of graffiti to be a derogatory media imposed um, stigma, and they really preferred to call themselves writers. Now, if we kind of think of them as writers, maybe we'll think of them a little differently, right? Um, and so, you know, this engages bigger questions. If graffiti artists are writers, in their, um, you know, commentary, in their illustrations, uh, document or documentation of a time, which should be archive, right? So I'm asking the question, you know, should this kind of be archive and how do we look at them that they look at themselves as writers? Uh, do they give voice to a subculture and a segment of society that has frankly been unheard and underserved? Um, also, it makes me think about the hieroglyphics and the writings on pyramid walls in Africa um, and in Central America. Um, these are considered value, valuable um, for, you know, historical literature and, you know, art, and they provide insight on their ways of lives. Um, and I'm asking the question, can street graffiti hold the same uh, elements in the same merit, right? The other thing that we need to know about graffiti is it's one of the four or five elements um, of hip hop alongside b-boying, emceeing, DJing, and knowledge and overstanding. Um, so this is a part you know, of a culture. And while, you know, hip hop music has kind of gained more acceptance, you know, graffiti art is still kind of uh, outcasted, especially by, you know, developers um, and urban designers seeking to kind of clean up urban areas, right? And so I kind of developed a list. I was just like, you know, I'll, I'll get into this a little later, but in some of my other work, I, I've been trying to kind of persuade, you know, city councils that this could be a good thing, right? And so I just did like negatives and positives. Uh, and so like graffiti, you know, you know, it's been looked at as, as negative as defa defacing uh, property throughout cities and towns. Graffiti can actually help to beautify spaces. Graffiti is related to urban decay. Maybe it can be related to urban renewal and culture and artistry, right? Um, and two, the, the other reason why I got into this is because a lot of my friends had like citations, you know, from the city. And I mean, in the realm of like a thousand of, you know, a thousand dollars or more. And I'm like, this is crazy, right? Like, you know what I mean? Do they have to be cited? Like, what is going on? And being arrested, right? And so instead of being arrested and cited, you know, graffiti artists can be valued as assets to society. Um, you know, um, also graffiti has been viewed as an outcasted art, but it can be looked at as a fine art celebrated and commissioned. Um, you can have kind of these informal museum, you know, urban galleries that people can walk through. Also, too, I feel like people need a, a space to practice, right? You know, mural artists draw these large scale murals. Well, don't they need place to kind of, you know, a place to kind of, you know, start or to sketch out some things, right? So, you know, you can have school groups down there um, and stuff like that, right? And also, you know, tourism, um, you know, conferences, et cetera. But also, you know, a lot of towns kind of complain about they don't have a big budget. You don't need a big budget to do this. You just need an empty building, some walls, an uh, area uh, to get this done. So actually, um, low budgets actually work, are an advantage, if you will, <laughs> because graffiti artists kind of like the grunge of a, of a space, right? They, you know, the dirtier it is, the better, right? Like, you know, so they don't mind it, right? You know, you know um, so that, that's fine. 
we see this being done in Hartford, right? Um, Hartford Heavens uh, Skate Park. You know, this uh, park was established um, in the summer of 2014. It, it was officially open. You can see, you know, that there was several people on the city council, you know, partnering with the community, also partnering with the, the Tony uh, Hawk uh, Foundation, as well as, you know, um, urban youth um, in Hartford who had a vested interest in this. They wanted this. This was something that they really uh, desired. But you would see that shortly before the park opened, you know, um, there was complaints by police and some uh, uh, residents that they only wanted the graffiti to go on two walls, right? They didn't want the graffiti everywhere. So skating, you know, wasn't the kind of issue. It was really the art of graffiti, you know, skating is kind of looked at as something that's, you know, um, you know, transient, that people come in and they come out, but the art kind of stays, right? So people were, people were a little nervous about that, you know, they, they didn't know, uh, you know, how, where's, where's this graffiti gonna go, right? Um, so skating was accepted, but graffiti was feared, right? Um, but happily, you know, it, 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 it did not get sanctioned to just two walls. Um, it's all over the place if you go down to Heaven Skate Park. Um, so some of the art um, in Heaven Skate Park is really, you know, it really is up to date, right? Um, it's, it's really current. You know, you want to know what the youth in Hartford think, um, you know, go down here and look, right? Um, so you see a black fist, you see Kobe Bryant, um, his passing at the beginning of 2020, right? And so people are going there to kind of, you know, say that we're here, we exist, and this is what we think is important, right? And so, you know, I, I you know, you have to wonder who are the people behind these walls, and, and obviously they have important things to say. Um, they are writing and drawing and crafting art with messages that are important to them and that need to be heard, right? Also, you know, and you see like people like Brianna Taylor uh, there. Um, so this is a, an important space. And also in this space, there is also urban development that is going up around it, right? You see the Dunkin' uh, Donuts uh, Park um, in the background here. And so the, you know, urban development and graffiti can coincide, right? Um, and they should be looked at as that in, the, in that in that manner, right? Um, but also, it's a matter of kind of refra reframing a uh, graffiti, right? If we just take this out of Heaven Skate Park and we frame it and, and put it in, it's, it's great work, right? <laughs> you know, and so it's about how we kind of reframe this conversation. Um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles hosted um, an exhibit that they call Art in the Street. And during the summer of, of 2000, um, it was during the summer of 2011. And the show was extremely popular, drawing more visitors than the museum had ever saw, right? And so this is, this is an opportunity. Um, and, and it also kind of, you know, it, it brings people into the fold, right, um, of the, the art world, which is important, right? So kind of reframing um, graffiti is, is important. So, you know, many people find their voice um, in graffiti uh, because it is an art form that is, is rooted in the kind of rejected and the misunderstood. Even when graffiti artists uh, gain a level of acceptance into the museum world, um, they, you know, at first, a lot of them are reluctant because they feel like kind of the imposer uh, syndrome kind of sets in. And so they ask themselves, like, do I belong here? You know, and, and then you have to ask yourself the question that Chantel Martin uh, always asks, and I love this question, you know, who are you, right? Um, they are also afraid of losing the rawness and the edge um, that makes graffiti dynamic, right? With entry of graffiti artists into formal museum spaces, it is important to secure legal graffiti spaces for others to sketch uh, their writing and their art into history. I think that that is kind of an important next step. You know, graffiti has been accepted into kind of the formalized museum, but it's also important to kind of create those spaces so people can develop 
you know, over time so that maybe someday they can be in the museum, or maybe it's just, you know, a space where they can go to kind of blow off some steam, right? Um, so it's, it, it, I think that this um, is really interesting. I want to explain how I kind of got into um, graffiti as a kind of study. I teach museum studies, I teach mater material culture at CCSU, um, but I am a 19th century historian um, that kind of dabbles in the museum world, right, through public history, right? And so this is how I got involved uh, with graffiti. Um, I'm from Rochester, New York, and Rochester, New York has an abandoned subway. And this abandoned subway isn't just any kind of subway. Um, it actually uh, was um, an aqueduct for the Erie Canal, this, um, this bridge that you're seeing here. And then it became uh, a subway tunnel between 1927 um, um, and it closed in 1956. But after it closed, you know, people just kind of abandoned this bridge. But luckily, graffiti artists moved in, right? And they said, well, the city doesn't want anything to do with this thing, right? And so if we just kind of look at the history of it, you see the arches underneath here. This is the Erie Canal flowing over the Genesee River in downtown Rochester. You can see that right at the bottom uh, level. Um, then it becomes a subway tunnel, right? Um, but after the subway closed in 19... 56, you know, people just kind of abandon the subway. So here, here it is, an abandoned subway. Nobody's paying any attention to it. Uh, but graffiti artists, they move in and, and make a gallery of it, if you will. And so, you know, you know, as a as a youth growing up in Rochester, you know, we used to venture down there, hang out, you know, see what was going on. Um, and it was just beautiful art down there. Um, and so you know, it's 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 in a, a area of urban you know development. It's kind of in the business district. You can see a Hyatt uh, hotel right there in the background there of this bridge. Um, so remember, you know, the history of the bridge, the Erie Canal, the aqueduct going over the top, the subway in the middle, and then this is the Broad Street Bridge on top here in the modern city uh, of Rochester. The other thing is that not too far from this bridge is um, some falls. This is high falls. I mean, many cities don't have a fall, like dropping through its skyscrapers. It's, it's kind of amazing. Um, and there's uh, upper falls and there's lower falls. So there's two falls, like literally located in a busy downtown area um, of Rochester. You can climb down there and stuff like that. The other interesting thing about the Genesee River is it actually flows north, like the Nile River in Africa flows north. So it's a very, very powerful river. It faces, empties, it empties uh, facing Canada, right? So it flows north. Um, so, you know, the questions be became like, what are we going to do with this, this subway tunnel that has all of this history you know, um, there was, you know, thoughts about kind of rewatering the aqueduct on top of it, um, you know, all types of thoughts. Uh, but you see the engineer, uh, Tom Hack, he, he, he said that, you know, it's absolutely amazing what they built down there. It'll blow you away. It's like having a skyscraper, sitting in a skyscraper on this side. But it became a question of like, what's going to happen uh, with this uh, space? And people we're, we're saying, you know, is this kind of a liability to the city? What should we do with it, right? Um, and so the easiest thing to do, uh, the city uh, engineer said was, you know, to fill it in. Um, but people, you know, that started a, a save the subway campaign and chill the fill. People were like, no, like don't do this, right? Um, to this, this, this kind of jewel. And you can see, you know, from the, the aqueduct uh, here, the downtown bridge, how it kind of runs under the city. They did fill a section of it, uh, but they were able to leave uh, the yellow section here um, unfilled uh, because of, you know, the kind of reaction uh, that it fueled up in, in Rochester. And you can see the kind of old subway, the old subway map um, of Rochester. The other thing is, I had a brother that, that lived in Pittsburgh for a while, and he was kind of amazed when he moved back to the city of Rochester that, you know, that he didn't see a lot of graffiti in the city. 
um, you know, just driving the streets. And that's because, you know, so much of it was going on underground that it actually kept people from not graffitiing other things because they had a space, you know what I mean, uh, to go to. Um, and so it was really, really interesting. And so you would get, um, this was like a world renowned museum to me, you know, <laughs> this, was a, this was open museum, um, you know, thousands of people would kind of visit it. You had, um, you know, people uh, that were doing art from places like Brazil. We had a friend, you know, come out from Albany, New York, and he was like, well, I heard this was a subway tunnel. I won't get arrested. Like, where, where is this thing, right? But Ecuador, Germany, people from Canada uh, come down to visit uh, this space, which is really, really interesting. Also, you can see that the Rochester uh, Memorial Art Gallery um, is going to start having events down here, too. You can see that people just on the weekends, they would take a scroll into the, the old subway tunnel just to see what was going on. Then they, people started to host events down there. There was concerts down there um, in the subway tunnel, which was really interesting. And again, the local art museum um, in Rochester start, started to, to have uh, some events. But you can see some of the artwork is just beautiful down there. I'm like, what a space, you know, what a jewel to have um, in a city. Um, it's kind of a cheap museum, right? You know, nobody, you know, there's, there's no tour guides or anything like that, but it, it was there, right? Um, and you can see this, the Save the Subway campaign when, when people started to kind of rail against the, um, the subway and saying that we need to fill it in, you know, there was kind of these these two battles of save the subway or save the city. Um, you can see that people were putting in the local newspaper, you know, what an eyesore this thing was, we have to get rid of it and stuff like that. But people uh, kind of railed back against this. And two, you know, as, as they were threatening to fill it in, I mean, they adopted the philosophy of Chantel Martin. They, I mean, you thought they were writing on everything before they would, you know, it was like tons of writing everywhere. It was kind of like 1970s um, uh, New York City down there, right? It, it was amazing to see the kind of reaction. Um, but again, just to show you, you know, some of the work that was going on down there uh, in the subway, in the subway tunnel. That was really, really cool. Um, and two, you see like families down there. It was, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, a bad environment. So, you know, how could um, the subway tunnel be reimagined? Um, and so you had a bunch of urban designers, this guy, uh, Kenneth uh, Martin, you know, I really liked some of what people were developing because it, it took the history of the Erie Canal, the history of the subway, and it kept graffiti because that's what the city was really trying to erase. The part where people had abandoned this thing, right? They kind of came in and, and kept it cool, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? But everybody was trying to move away from it, uh, the, the, the graffiti element of it. And we were saying like, no, that's a valid part of this bridge's history, right? And so he came up with this idea of having, you know, um, uh, a concert hall called Spray, and then another uh, venue called Aqueduct. And I just thought it was cool that, you know, like the city was was never going to do this, but I, I just thought it was cool. You know, I talked to him, you know, we, you know he, he showed me some of the things that he was, he was kind of working on. And I thought it was just neat that he involved both the Erie Canal history, the subway uh, history, and the graffiti history, which is a valid part. Um, of that of that bridge, you can see he's he's trying to rewater the top and have a walkway and stuff like that. Um, he did some uh, kind of traffic studies. The Broad Street Bridge, nobody really goes over it in Rochester. It's kind of interesting because it's at the center of of the city, but nobody really uses it. But also, I thought about the New York High Line when I was thinking about this space. You know, the New York uh, High Line. Um, you know, in most uh, North American cities, you know they really kind of lack creativity um, in urban planning. And they replace, you know, culture with condos and graffiti with gentrification, right? And I just thought, you know, what a great example to show, to show city officials. I started working with a city historian, you know, we we're gonna set up meetings with the city council and stuff like that. Actually had a couple meetings with the city council and stuff like that. Um, and so I was really trying to pitch this ideal that we can make this like the New York City um, High Line. I don't know if you guys have been to the New York City High Line. Absolutely beautiful. But what that uh, space also does is involve 
art, right? Art is an intricate part um, of that space, right? Um, and it really kind of jazzes, jazzes it up, um, if you will. And so, you know, the New York City High Line is about the same, um, you know, kind of, um, kind of distance as the Rochester Tunnel, uh, but the city didn't quite uh, buy it. Um, so what the city ended up doing with the subway tunnels, or what what happened, right, uh, <laughs> um, is they they built a condo, um, and the condo would would block um, the most traffic, it, the most uh, you know um, travel entry into the subway tunnel, and they 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 kind of blocked the subway tunnel for um, a parking spots uh, beneath the new condo building, 100 parking spots. Um, and so that, that beautiful um, entry that you had here is now covered up um, for this, this, this parking garage, which is basically a dead end. When you're traveling through the subway tunnel, you just bump into a wall, which you, you can't, you know, you can't get out. Um, and so it's, you know, they replaced it uh, for, a condo building called the Nathaniel. Um, and so there it is. Um, and so, you know, it, it was uh, disheartening, but there's still other um, interests. You can see that that bridge that I just described to you there. Um, and so the access to it was, uh, is now a parking lot for the new uh, condo uh, building and you can no longer access it through its most popular. And two, it was, a, it was an inclined plane down into the subway bed. So it was actually, you know, accessible for everybody to get down there. Um, and so it was really, really kind of neat. Um, nonetheless, the other thing that the, the, the city of Rochester has done which I think that if, if you hear this out of any city that what makes the city unique um, is its waterfront, that's not true, right? Because every city, every you know, city has a waterfront. Uh, that's, that's why it's a city, you know, Las Vegas is kind of the outlier because it doesn't have water, you know what I mean? So that, it was like so weird. I'm like, so a subway tunnel with great art in it isn't unique, right? So they said, no, 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 the waterfront. The other thing about this waterfront is I showed you it and I showed you kind of how powerful it is because it flows north and it's really kind of dangerous because, uh, you know, you can you can literally fall over the falls. Uh, Sam Patch, uh, you know, he he uh, made a jump into Niagara Falls, came to Rochester and died uh, because he jumped from High Falls. High Falls, this is a day, you know, I don't, I don't even know if you want to develop on the waterfront in Rochester because it's so dangerous if anybody gets past um, the dikes and stuff like that, um, you know, because the, you got two waterfalls you'll go over. So even like kids in the city that kind of play around and they're, you know, pushing each other and stuff like that. Once they walk over a city bridge in Rochester, they're like, all right, you know, we're, we're not fooling around over these bridges, right? Um, but nonetheless, so they, they said that the most unique thing about Rochester is its waterfront. Um, you can say that about Buffalo, you can say that about Hartford, you can say that about New London, I mean, you know, um, and so it's really, really interesting what happened, but you can see the perspective from the condo to the actual uh, bridge um, and the waterfalls is not too far from the bridge. The other thing I wanted to highlight is what has a surface from the subway. Now this is important because what has surfaced from the subway um, is this uh, kind of collective wall therapy. And wall therapy was established in um, 2012 and has produced over 100 uh, pieces in the city. They do about 20 uh, murals um, a year. It's, 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 it has uh, you know, stopped, I think, about 2018. It kind of uh, fell off, but you can see that what these graffiti artists would do, and there's graffiti artists from all over the world, some of which I've listed, is they would contract with property owners to say like, you know, what do you want on your building? And it became so popular that it was like, if you didn't have graffiti on your building, you were the outlier, right? Like you, you, wanna, you wanna have graffiti on your building, right? Like, um, and so they would have these artists come in. It was really transforming the city because, you know, Rochester is, is kind of, you know, it's, it's located very north, right? I, I, I even say like now living in Connecticut, like Connecticut's like a summer oasis for me. Like, you know, Rochester is freezing. And also the sun sets very early in the winter. So, you know, this was kind of giving light to the city, right? That you can see these kind of creative 
uh, works of art throughout the city that were really cool and inventive that were done from artists, you know, from around the world that came in every summer that inspired our young, you know, kids in the city. And so that was just really cool. And even like, you know, churches were like, you know, can we get in on like we want we want graffiti on our buildings, right? Uh, again, employing the ideal Chateau Martin right on everything, right? We don't care what it is, right? Um, which is just great, you know? And two, they would, you know, they would say like, this is a fish market, right? So they would say, you know, what can we do that kind of incorporates what you do, right? And so, you know, um, but the other thing is, is that when these graffiti artists would kind of come in and these artists would come in, they would want to visit the subway tunnel. And sometimes you would see sketches of what they would do later because they needed like practice space. So this was a great practice space for what they were eventually going to be doing, right? Um, and so, you know, this one kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, had some, you know, people that that really didn't like it. it's called bears. Um, and so it was right across from a church and they were like, what are these bears doing? And so, but most of them went off pretty, pretty well, wasn't much kind of pushback, but also, you know, the city kids really kind of took to this. Uh, they started to celebrate um, the, the, the urban uh, areas that they inhabited and really these art pieces they, they identified with, they thought they were beautiful and, and stuff like that. So it's really, really interesting. One of the, the artists that would emerge also from the subway tunnel is Sean uh, Dewitty. Uh, Sean Dewitty, um, you know, he said, if you can't bring people to art, um, then bring the art to the people. And so he started to, you know, create things throughout the city. Um, he wanted to get away from kind of the gallery arrest um, of things, but also just the positive wording uh, that he would put throughout the city uh, really kind of gained uh, a name um, in the city. Also, you know, took kids to, to Brazil to do graffiti and um, he's, he spoke at commencements in Rochester. Um, and so he's really become like an asset, you know, emerging from uh, the subway of Rochester. The other thing he does is he's involved in like, you know, public art projects where he'll sketch out the project and anybody can come down and fill in, um, you know, what he's kind of sketched out and help him out, uh, which is like really, really uh, neat. So it becomes like a community uh, thing. So with that being said, um, I would like to take a, a quick pause to show um, a film called Confronting the Walls, um, produced by David Marshall and um, Chris uh, Christopher, um, or filmed by them, um, and Sean DeWitty is featured in it. Are you, are you trying to say that? kinds of walls. Some are just harder to see. It could be poverty, uh, bad schools, crime, guns, drugs, it's all around us here. And sometimes the hardest walls to climb are the ones we create ourselves. That's why I think the work I do with young people gives them the right footing to climb. I picked one of Rochester's most uh, distressed uh, neighborhoods for my current project, in part because it's a neighborhood that's always left out. They call it ghost town. This is the park right there where uh, they came in to build and everybody complains it's just a drug spot. <laughs> that's where the drug dealers hang out. Some of the things that are going on in this neighborhood is uh, seventh most dangerous neighborhood <laughs> in the nation. Uh, as far as the state, uh, it's one of the highest and uh, high density of, of poverty in the state. It's like in the top five. Um, it's got the largest number in New York State of uh, single female-led or women-led homes, you know, single, single moms um, in the state. I mean, there's a lot going on in this neighborhood. 
that there's a, there's a third white, third black, a third Latino. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with poverty. It has to do with people with, with lost opportunities. It has to do with people who, who need um, uh, some support. It has nothing to do with one skin color, what's going on in this uh, neighborhood. Uh, my name is uh, Sean Dunwoody. Pleasure to be in here. Uh, to give you a bit of history about myself, uh, Rochester native, born and raised, went to city schools, uh, got tossed out of city schools, hung on the corner, did what I had to do. Uh, but there were a handful of people who actually would talk to me and say, you know what, you don't need to be doing this, you can do this, you can do that, try other things, expose me to other things. I was like, damn, I didn't know this side of the world even existed. I didn't even leave my block. Um, and that's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about people working together. I believe people can grow and people can change. And uh, if we don't invest in each other, we don't have anything. We don't have anything. All right, so this is the Fruit Belt Project. And what we're going to do is we're going to be painting two large buildings in the J and Grape Street area. You know where that is? I know where J Street is, and I don't know where the other one is. That's OK. You don't have to know. Okay. Just as long as you show up for time on work, we'll be all right. OK. OK. <laughs> um, and our, we're going to be painting these two big buildings. So you'll be working with me. It's actually a full-time job. So. Um, I spend a lot of time um, picking the right kids. They don't have to be artists because I'll lead them along the way. They all start off, you know, because it's a job. And there aren't a lot of jobs for these kids. But they end up staying because it becomes more than just a paycheck. Yeah, so you need a job, basically. Is that, <laughs> that's predominantly. Just good. tell me what you're doing, that's all. <laughs> We can, we can save the flu for later. Yeah, you need some money. Everybody needs money. Um, so I'm looking to hire five young people. Uh, we're, we're the range from 16 to 21. Perfect. <laughs> These kids, um, Kari, Aziza, Ephra, Kokinas, and Karina, have to deal daily with the struggles of living in a community in poverty. But we have a vision. We have imagination. We have a goal, and we have pain. No, you ain't. There's a lot of violence and drugs going on. My siblings are still younger and very impressionable. So knowing that we're doing these projects and he could actually look at them and see how cool it is that his older sister is doing, maybe he'll take something from me and do something creative and worthwhile. I don't really, I don't really stay in my neighborhood, you know, but when I do sometimes walk on the streets, you know, it's needles and stuff like that, and, you know, it's a crime, it's a, like, it's a, it's pretty, pretty, um, a lot of crime going on over there. This project is really based around like creating positive works of art in like less fortunate areas and neighborhoods. It makes me feel um, proud to say that I I am a part of a project that is doing something positive in the community. Poverty. <laughs> Yeah, poverty, it builds some pretty intense walls. You can't see how much dignity you have. You can't see how proud you should be of yourself or of your surroundings. Um, you know, it, it boxes you in. So um, the more that we introduce art, the more those walls will come down because they won't be able to fit what's inside of them. You know, you got, you got color for me to fill this eye in? You got something for me to fill this in? Yeah, your foot is gonna be on that side. Okay, take both of them off. Every summer, as many as 20 muralists and graffiti artists converge on Rochester from around the globe. I want my young artists to connect with them and get a taste of the global movement to rehabilitate neighborhoods. These are some of the best known wall artists in the world. You know, I, I grew up in a neighborhood where it was uh, very gang affiliated, and art is something that's 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 fun and safe that we can all gravitate towards. And yeah, you know, not not everybody has the luxury of having 
a, a nice household, a, a mom and dad to provide direction. Not everybody has the luxury of, of being athletic or, or being being able to to gravitate toward music or find music or, or or anything. And for those of us that find art, I mean, it's really something that has helped us out. I believe. I mean, it's helped me out. Art has the power to tear down walls that confine us. Art opens hearts and minds. It binds wounds. It sparks out of the box thinking, which leads to innovation. How can this help struggling young lives in a struggling city? I'll tell you how. Cool. That was confronting walls. Um, you can watch the full. Uh, that was just a preview. So if you're interested, you can look it up. Uh, take a look at the the whole uh, project by uh, Sean Dewitty. Also check out his his um, his website. I uh, want to kind of turn to um, Chantel Martin um, because you know she talks about you know graffiti too and how she got into um, graffiti which I find interesting. I would kind of situate her somewhere between uh, Basquiat and Sinban Joe, um, if you will. Um, of course, we got to know who Basquiat is. Um, but Sinban Joe, um, he, you know, uh, you know, he kind of reminds me um, of, of Martin's work uh, because of the black and white, but also too the work that they're doing um, on people, uh, which, is, which is neat. Um, as well um, as a as a canvas, um, you see that early on she she talks about how she got into graffiti. You know her friend was doing graffiti. Um, she got sick of waiting on them, so she you know started to tag stuff herself uh, because she got bored, and so she started uh, to try out you know graffiti for herself. The other interesting thing I find about graffiti, and I said this uh, with kind of my opening remarks, is that it's really an art of the kind of outsider, right? Um, you see how, you know, uh, Martin is feeling like much of an, an outsider, um, you know, having finished art school and not being able to kind of crack into um, the art world um, in any kind of serious uh, way uh, to have a career. Um, and so she felt those kind of uh, blockades. And so, you know, you know, it's just kind of interesting to read about her her kind of start of how she got into uh, graffiti. Um, but also, um, I, I like the, I really like the questions that her, her work uh, kind of poses. Uh, Martin's work uh, tells the viewer not to look at the art stagnantly, uh, but um, it says, you know, to really look back at yourself, you know, who are you? And I, I like it that she doesn't use uh, question marks um, as well, but you can see, um, you know, how she's using language uh, with her art um, to really kind of ask these, these pivotal uh, questions, which I think is amazing. And this is, you know, obviously seen in her new and now uh, collection uh, at the museum. Are you really you know, being true, right? I really like uh, the questions, but also the improvisation and being present. Um, you know, she says that if people are watching me, um, I have that pressure. It puts me in a position where I do not have the time to think about what I am doing. Um, you know, I just got to you know, do it, right? Just got to get into it. Um, and so I really, really like that. And also the, just uh, being present, right? You know, someday, one day, today, you know, being in uh, the moment um, is what her work uh, really does. Um, the innovation, alongside doing excellent artwork, Martin is creating, you know, writing tools for other others to create uh, their own works uh, to share with the world. I really think that this is just unique because, you know, she's helping, you know, the kind of future um, of, of artists uh, by kind of inventing, you know, tools uh, perhaps that they can use her entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I really wanted to highlight some of her work with uh, Puma, which is just amazing. Also um, her work with the cycling company um, as well. Um, but also, you know, Martin, 
um, and these and new age artists, you know, really kind of creating tools for like future artists to use. I find that this is really interesting. And it reminds me of what Christian Scott Atunde Ajawa, a uh, jazz artist from New Orleans is doing um, as well. Um, and so, you know, Christian Scott is a, a, um, a jazz artist. Um, you can see too how he kind of invokes the kind of present, you know, yesterday uh, you said tomorrow, he's, he's kind of asking like, well, what the hell about today, right? <laughs> what about the now, right? This ideal just being uh, present. But also in the kind of the trumpets that he's creating, it kind of reminds me of what Chantel Martin is doing with drawing uh, utensils, right? Um, and so he's creating all these different kind of flugel horns um, and kind of tools to help future artists. He's, he's you know, the, the horn being bent um, you know, uh, has been done, but the way he's bending it is so that the trumpet player can actually hear themselves while they're playing because, you know, when it's kind of straight ahead, you can't really hear uh, what, you're, what you're playing, right? And so just the unique things that they're, they're kind of doing, I like it that the new artists are kind of thinking about the future of the enterprise, right? Um, and what we can do to kind of, you know, bend and have, you know, uh, better tools um, for future generations. Also the collaborations. Um, you know, the improvisation goes right along with hip hop because, you know, when you're freestyling, that is improvisation. You also see uh, that Christian Scott Atunde Ajua uh, works with people like Saul Williams. Um, the other thing that I think that, you know, Christian Scott is doing that's interesting is that he has a scratch music uh, app, which allows you to listen to his music. But if you just want to hear the bass line, you can just listen to the bass line, right? If you just want to hear what the piano is doing. And so these kind of innovative things that these new uh, artists are doing to help future generations, right? He's saying, like, if you're practicing, you want to play my horn lines, you can, you know, take my horn line out so you can play in it. Like, you know, it's just like really cool. Like, you know, I think, you know, people will want those those types of um, things, you know, today. But also, you know, her her uh, visiting um, scholar um, opportunity at MIT in 2014, uh, through 2015, um, again, just, you know, innovative ways. If we want to have, you know, new inventions, we also have to invoke art and creativity. Uh, outro, um, constant advocation is needed. Uh, so graffiti and its artists are not outed um, in other but get the spaces or legally zone uh, places to practice and to etch themselves into the present and into history. Indeed, this is a cliche statement, but the possibilities are endless. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Broyle. Uh, this was so enlightening and, and invigorating and inspiring in every way. Um, I, I wonder, is there some sort of a, a map, some kind of a graffiti trail that you might at some point share? So we can plan a journey. Yeah, yeah, I, I could do that um, through um, walk therapy. I mean, that was, the, that was the other thing that they were doing as well as having tours. People would come to the city and get a, a tour um, of the of the different art pieces. So yeah, I could potentially do that in the future. I would I would welcome that opportunity. Uh, the link is certainly there, so you can see all of the artists um, that have participated in wall therapy. Uh, the last, the, the other thing I wanted to say about Rochester is that Rochester, it's called the Image City. Um, Kodak Camera is there, the head of Kodak Camera um, is there in Rochester. Rochester has always been a city of kind of imagery, uh, starting from Bash Alam, um, that was an eyeglass company. And so, you know, through you need good lenses to have, you know, good cameras, right? And then from there, you also have Xerox that started um, in Rochester. And basically that's just taking a picture of a document. And so this, this you know, city has a history of like imagery and it's, it's kind of, you know, awful that they, you know, don't kind of see the importance of that kind of, you know, moving forward. But hopefully, hopefully we can get them to see clearly um, that that is important to the city. Thanks. Um very nice. I, I, we have some questions. I do want to make sure that we get to them. So um, one of the first questions was asking Dr. Broyles, what are your thoughts and impressions of Wynwood Walls in Miami? <laughs> I was just down in Florida uh, for the uh, Christmas holiday 
Um, and I was planning to go, but something came up. So I am so, so upset. Um, and two, my family, my mother's from Florida. Um, and so I've been to Florida over 50 times and I've never been to Miami. And the one time I was going to go this, you know, Christmas holiday, it was probably safer not to. So, so I decided not to go. But I think that that's the type of spaces that cities should be looking uh, to have. You know, why can't every city kind of, you know, you know, sanction or zone the space uh, for graffiti art. It's very interesting too, because like every city now has like a skate park and I've been, you know, I've sat in skate park and I literally sat in a skate park one time and watched somebody break their leg, right? You know, graffiti is not, you know, it's not as dangerous as like skating, right? So I feel like this could easily be done, but there's such a perception um, of graffiti that is still, you know, there is such a stigma about it, uh, stigmatized. But also you have to think about who are the people that are skating versus who are the people that are doing graffiti art. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of something for the, you know, the suburban kid that wants to be a rebel to do. There's somewhere for him to go, right? <laughs> you know, but like the urban kid that just wants to, you know, you know, to graffiti on something, you know, it, it's it's not a space per se for them to go, right? And so I think it's all about, you know, who's doing it and kind of, you know, you can kind of bring in the social justice aspects there. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to eventually visit uh, Miami and I will get there <laughs> one way or another because that was also part of our pitch to the city of Rochester when I was working with the city historian, um, Christina Radarski in Rochester, New York, um, on this project, you know, we were researching, you know, different cities and how they did it. You know, it's very interesting too, because we were looking at like, you know, like, you know, environmentally friend, uh, friendly, if you will, graffiti or spray paint, excuse me. Um, so we were looking at that. We were also looking at like face coverings. And now I, I guess we don't have to worry about that too much because, you know, people know kind of how to properly wear a face mask because we were looking at that because we were going to zone it, right? We wanted to provide, you know, stuff so that people wouldn't harm themselves while they're, while they're down there. But it's, it's really kind of an inexpensive endeavor if cities would just get on board. I mean, it doesn't really cost you you know, that much, like, you know what I mean? And so, and so it's really, it's really interesting, but I will eventually get to Miami. Well, I mean, now I think we all want to go there. Uh, this though dovetails perfectly into the next question, which is specifically, are there neighborhoods um, or places, abandoned areas, structures underutilized parks in the city of New Britain uh, or surrounding towns that you see having this type of potential? I do. I do. Um, I was in conversations uh, with um, with a number of people about this in Connecticut. I think that this is a great opportunity. Um, say if a museum has an abandoned building near them and they just wanted to, you know, say purchase it, it wouldn't cause a lot to maintain it. It really would. I mean, you open it up, you maybe have, you know, hours or something like that. Um, it can be dirty. I don't think anybody cares about that. All you have to do is make sure it's properly ventilated and, 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 and lit at night if you're going to have it open at night. But other than that, it's not a big overhead cost. And you can call it like your museum, you know, 2.0 or something, you know what I mean? And you could have events there. And it's really like a public space. And there's tons of abandoned buildings. That's the other thing. Like, you know what I mean? You need an abandoned building. I'll come to New Britain and point a couple out to you. How about that? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's, there's tons of opportunity to do this. Like, and it's such a, um, it's such a way to engage uh, the public. And it's so unconventional that if you're bored on a Friday night or something like that, and you want to, you know, go spray paint your name on something, I mean, why not? You know, why not have spaces for that? Um, I also think you can kind of bring in like, you know, kind of like First Amendment ideals too, to to kind of be, you know, because uh, it doesn't only protect, you know, speech, but it protects artwork as well. And so I think that it, it'll be a great space, you know, um, to, to do some amazing things. I love it. We have some other great questions. Uh, do you worry about graffiti being co-opted by the mainstream and losing its edge and no longer being the, you know, outsider art realm? So that's the thing, and that's why I think that it was so kind of easy to bring in Chantel Martin because, um, you know, now she's kind of the outsider that's 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 in. But the thing is, the danger is not inviting like them in, um, and kind of having them uh, at the table. And I think 
you know, they go back to those those roots of of what you know they got started with, right? And so I think that rawness and that edge is is always always there. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is a fear. I feel like the artists fear that more than we do though. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they will, they will self-check themselves because they're afraid of that, that same thing. Right. You know? <laughs> so they're like, you know, they, they'll make sure. And that's why I think it was so cool that you had like uh, art therapy in Rochester in the kind of subway, because those things kind of feed off of one another. Um, and the, you know, the kind of fine art of like these murals needs that that grit and that grind to kind of as practice space, right? You can take art classes there. Like how about a, you know, a high school art class just go down there and do something, right? I mean, it's a great way to kind of practice large scale um, art. So I think that the artists themselves will kind of self check themselves once they get in the kind of fine museum uh, world, they'll keep that that grunge, uh, they'll keep that that grit. Okay. Uh, two questions that are sort of related that I'll try to put together about, um, would you comment on whether graffiti spaces should remain untouched or be painted over to provide space for new art? And similarly, um, what happens if legal graffiti space, um, the, it gets filled up? Yeah, and so I feel like that's the thing too that I will argue that it doesn't take a big budget um, because it'll paint over itself eventually, right? Um, the other thing is like if you go to Graffiti Heaven or Heaven Skate Park, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if you go there, like the kind of big, large piece, they don't mess with those, right? They they sell. There's a a self checking um, of themselves that they're doing themselves, right? Um, and there's an editing process that they're going through themselves. So you don't even need to do that. If you, if you want to say like, hey, you know, every two years we'll come in and whitewash it or something like that, you could, but I mean, they'll just kind of draw over it themselves, right? And that's what I mean by this is such a space where you just leave it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, maybe if there's obscenities and stuff like that, that you don't like, or, you know, maybe you can just erase those things. But most of it, you know, allow it to be unedited and allow them to kind of self-check themselves. They self-govern. There's a governance system within graffiti. They govern themselves. Like go to Heaven Skate Park. You'll see all of the, the nice kind of pieces of Breonna Taylor, of, you know, Kobe Bryant. Nobody's touching those. They, they, and that's what I mean by like, it doesn't, all you have to do is make it a legal graffiti space. That's all you got to do. And the rest, you know, and then two, if you didn't, notice um, in Heaven's uh, Skate Park, I was down there after it had, it had snowed one day and they didn't even plow it, but it doesn't even matter. You don't have to plow it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You literally, there is no maintenance involved. Like, you know, it was literally like the, you know, the plow just went around the whole park, right? you know, uh, around the outside of the, the whole park. Nothing was plowed on the inside and that's fine. No, nobody cares, right? You know, I mean, they they understand the risk that they're taking once they they enter, right? Um, and they like the grunge. They 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 like it that way. It's fine. It does seem like a lot of the imagery, you know, kind of that issue of um, almost like collaging over it becomes part of the whole artwork. It's very very collaborative, very community driven, which yeah. is really exciting. Um, so that's those were great questions and. Uh, great answers. Uh, I think that, you know, people are envisioning in some of the chats here, wouldn't it be great to have workshops to involve people in the, you know, learning more about how to make graffiti like we saw in the film um, and thinking more about uh, one comment, thinking of the traveling graffiti on trains mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a comment in the, in the chat. So I think you've uh, really inspired some creative thinking and I know we're going to do a lot of looking for spaces and great graffiti um, in our in our realm. So we thank you so very much. Please sign me up to help. <laughs> okay. Well, this is going to be part one of something beyond, right? Okay, so we look cool. forward to seeing you again really soon, Dr. Broyled. And right. thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Be well. <laughs>